recording. Hey, everybody, it's Sandra Miller, and I want to thank you for being with me tonight. Um, this is going to be a really good training. I'm going to try to go through all the material really quickly. Um, again, I'm Sandra Miller, and I'm a health coach. Uh, I've been a health coach for about 30 years, lifestyle and weight management consultant. And I wanted to bring this training to you because so many people are spending good time. We're all really busy today. We're all trying to do the right things. And for some reason, a lot of us are just not having a good time at it. Um, we may you know, get a little bit of weight loss, fat loss, or health improvement. Then we backslide. There's a lot of challenges in the way. And I totally get it. Um, before I start tonight's training called The Big Fat Secret, um, talking about healthy fats and the best way to weight loss. I need to quickly read you just my disclaimer and then we can get on with the training. But Sandra Miller provides presentation services to those who seek health information that may be used by individuals to improve their health, fitness, or understanding of how the human body functions best. Sandra Miller may also provide the present team ways or means to help change habits that lead to more successful implementation of health improvement strategies presented. Information presented may come from publications, studies, websites, webinars, lectures, or other printed media-based material. I may share by means of digital delivery through email existing publications that relate to the subject matter to be presented as a matter of convenience only. Now, the relationship should not be construed as health coaching. Rather, my services to you is to bring you the latest research information um, on the study of health, human performance, and metabolism from doctors, scientists, and nutritionists, and forward thinkers. I will guide you to the science that most closely suggests benefits geared to the challenges that you are trying to improve. Okay, so with that said, let me get on to sharing my screen a little bit here. And we can get started. All right. So big fat secret. What is the big fat secret to, wealth, uh, to weight loss? Um, and it's really healthy fats. And we're going to talk about that tonight. They are the key to longevity, weight loss, and metabolic health. Pretty much everything you face, whether it's fat loss, hormonal problems, diabetes, cholesterol issues, aches and pains, erectile dysfunction. I mean, there's a ton of stuff I could go on and on and on, but what it all boils down to is that for decades, we have been deceived. We have been following a lie for over 60 years. Now, I don't know about you, but that really pisses me off because I follow the science and I have spent a lot of time researching the things that make us healthy because I am a health coach. I have to do this for myself, I have to do this for other people. But we have been lied to and I'm gonna explain a little bit about that and why the tide is turning and it's now time to, to just put this whole sugar thing to bed and start really opening our eyes to what the real science is and has been showing for years. Some of it's been a little bit buried. So in 1972, um, and our issues happened 20 years before this, but in 1972, um, a gentleman wrote a book called Pure, White, and Deadly. And the book came out, and really its intention was kind of to summarize um, evidence that the overconsumption of sugar was leading to all of the health problems and metabolic challenges that we face, like obesity, um, liver disease, gout, um, even heartburn and some cancers. So the big food was in an uproar over this, and they said there is no theoretical basis for what you have presented in this book. It's a lie. Um, the message was very unwelcome, and there a huge undertaking happened to come up with strategies to interfere with the funding of this guy's research and prevent the publication of his book. And it was just really a mess. And one of the people who really hardcore was up against this gentleman was a guy named Ansel Keys. You know, Ansel Keys was also working with the government and tried to discredit the author because he was trying to bring, at the time, to, I guess it was the ADA, um, the guidelines that we would be following for the next several decades. And his um, recommendations came after a study of, uh, was called the Seven Countries Studies. And 
he put everything together and said that this would now become policy. And um, he was pretty much in the president's pocket. They took his word for it, bought it hook, line, and sinker, and here we are. So that's the culprit. You can throw some darts at your screen. That's the guy who did it. But I got to tell you, Ansel Keys was a pretty brilliant guy. So I think perhaps that there was some monetary factors involved because he was a really intelligent guy. He actually helped create the Mediterranean diet, he and his wife. And also what he did was he created K rations. And I just, uh, here's a picture of them here, which were those uh, like military meals in a can. Um, you know, you could live for a week on something that practically fit in your pocket. So, I mean, he wasn't a dumb guy. He was a brilliant guy, but it was his actions directly and the continued actions of the government to repeat past failures. That's why we're in the position we're in right now. So if what I'm saying is true, um, you know, and we believe the science that says that it, it really was uh, sugar after all, and it wasn't fat, how can we kind of prove that? Well, all we have to do is look at statistics. I mean, look at this. In 1986, when they started to really follow the statistics of obesity in our country, they didn't have a whole lot of data. But through 1994 and then on to 2002, it's pretty clear to see what states are having the most difficulty and the most rates of obesity. If you look at the 2009 chart of the US, you can see that the southern countries have the highest obesity. And the reason for that is because they do a lot of deep frying. So that means you have to coat a refined flour, stick it in an oil that is damaging to the arteries and fry something. So you're putting two things together that really shouldn't be together. And if it's fried up crispy, it makes it even worse, almost deadly. So that's why they have the most obesity rates. If you look at uh, the 2015, results, um, we're still, we're just not looking so good. Really, only Colorado and, um, you know, California and Utah are even remote, maybe even Massachusetts, are remotely healthier than the rest of the country. But it's, it's pretty shocking to see the statistics that have occurred with obesity when for the past 50 or 60 years, we've been you know, we've had it shoved down our throat, low fat, low fat, low fat, fat will kill you, saturated fat, don't eat it, it's terrible, right? But, you know, you should eat six to 11 uh, servings of grains a day. Yeah, well, that's why we're in the position that we're in. And that's because sugar is the sweetest deception there could ever be. We have an addiction with sugar that is very difficult to break because of the way sugar acts on two things. One is our pancreas and our insulin. You eat some, you shoot out insulin. That insulin pulls the sugar in, gives it to your cells, but there's usually a little insulin hanging out that says, give me sugar. And in, in that sense, it makes you hungry, so you need to eat again. You might need to take just a few little bites. I just need something quick to munch on. I'm not starving, but I'm just a little hungry. Yeah, well, that's insulin screaming at you, okay? So it also acts similar to alcohol in the liver, especially fructose. Fructose is hidden in a lot of products like ketchups and sauces and some seasonings and um, you know other things, but fructose could be as simple as fruit. Too much fruit can cause a fatty liver, it is a fact. It is a sad fact, but it is a fact. Um, so fructose is the main cause of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it is twice as addictive as cocaine. But the worst problem with sugar is the fact that it raises insulin. Every single time you raise your insulin, you are creating inflammation. Insulin is pro-inflammatory, and inflammation is pretty much at the root of all disease, and it is definitely at the root of metabolic dysfunction. So that surge, 
um, that you get every single time your insulin surges, every time you nibble on a few M&Ms or a piece of fruit, something like that, crackers, that insulin is going up and up and up and up. Just it's constant. And then we find that we can't keep food, you know, we can't keep anything out of our mouths. We want to constantly eat. So, I mean, of course, it's also tied to diabetes. And honestly, diabetes is not a sugar problem. It's an insulin problem because most diabetics make plenty of insulin unless they're type 1. The problem is their cells aren't listening. The body has kind of turned a deaf ear to the signal of insulin and it's just a, it's a metabolic mess. So most people in the U.S. today are eating about 30 to 34 five-pound bags of sugar a year, or an equivalent of 150 to 170 pounds of it. And that's the problem. Now, the problem with that is we really only need a little bit maybe a couple teaspoons a day, and our body is pretty good at making it. So this is just really, really, really overkill. There is just no way the body can keep up with this, and it's coming out as diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a, an insulin-based illness, um, and all kinds of other cholesterol problems. Your know, doctor's telling you your cholesterol's high, stop eating fat and salt, and, and actually that's not the culprit at all. And we're gonna get into that just a little bit. So honestly, sugar is a direct contributor to premature aging and wrinkles, almost as much as alcohol. Probably right, right, right up underneath that. Now, if we think of the acronym AGE, A-G-E, that stands for Advanced Glycation End Products. And if we think of it this way, it's almost like putting an inferior gas into your car and out the back tailpipe comes black yucky smoke and some sputters and, <clears throat> you know, um, and poor quality performance of your engine. So you do get poor quality performance of your engine when you're running on sugar because it doesn't last long. You have to keep filling the tank. What a pain that is. I am so glad to be free of the having to eat every two to three hours crap that ran my life for over 30 years. Um, it's just a wonderful freeing feeling to only have to eat a couple of times a day. Most of the time, only two, uh, sometimes less. Glycation and inflammation come from sugar and grains, that inflammation we talked about coming from sugar and processed food that raises insulin that's pro-inflammatory, but also when sugar connects to proteins, it's called glycation, and that's pretty much like rust in your engine, but also in your brain and in your arteries, so it leaves behind byproducts of metabolism. It's not a clean burning fuel um, at all. And that's the problem with it. It's leading to metabolic diseases, like I mentioned, of diabetes, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, Alzheimer's and dementia. Alzheimer's and dementia, the brain forms plaques and tangles um, and pretty much looks like this picture when somebody has a severe case of dementia. And this is really mainly, there is a genetic component. I'm not gonna say there isn't, but let me say this about genetics. When it comes to things like diabetes and oh, you know, it's in the family. It's fine if it's in the family. It doesn't have to be in your body because what happens is genes load the gun, but they don't pull the trigger environment pulls the trigger and food is the biggest influence to your environment aside from the water you drink the air you breathe and what you put on your body okay so um, all of these complications of glycation like neuropathy retinal disease for diabetics and kidney failure all stem from um, glycation now elevated levels of um, AGEs also deplete nitric 
oxide levels. And what are the two things you might know about nitric oxide? Well, I can tell you that nitric oxide helps expand blood vessels. So obviously circulation, cholesterol, all of those things get worse when we are glycating, when we have those advanced glycation end products from sugar and refined carbohydrates and processed foods. And also it's going to promote vascular damage, which I'm going to be talking about in just a minute. But isn't sugar our primary fuel source? How are we going to live without that? There's been a lot in the media about that, you know, and, and that honestly, Gatorade is going to tell you that you need it to replace electrolytes, but you don't, because what did we do before Gatorade? You know, that it, you don't need to replace sugar unless you're a sugar burner. My goal is to get you to start to become a fat burner and stop being held by the chains of being a sugar burner. We have metabolic flexibility as human beings, which is a great thing. We can burn glucose or ketones or lactate, just like a hybrid car. We have several mechanisms of survival. If one fuel is unavailable, our body knows how to switch to use another fuel. Lactate is typically, it's a great fuel for the brain. It's typically only used during intense exercise. So obviously we can't use that during the day. It's not convenient. Glucose is convenient, but again, you have to keep refilling the tank and it leaves byproducts. But ketones, now ketones, you can burn those for a very long time and they burn clean and every single thing that happens from them being in your body is absolutely 150% positive, right down to living longer and better. Okay, now proteins, carbs, and fats are typically our sources of fuel, but the body really runs better on ketones, and we can't really get to a place typically without help um, where we can burn those ketones unless we cut out the carbohydrates. Now, when it comes to cutting out carbohydrates, I don't recommend you do it all at once. I actually have um, a video on YouTube that is called biohacking blood sugar, which weans you down over the course of several weeks. It teaches you about meal timing so that you're not getting that yo-yo effect, how to eat in an eating window so that 30 minutes before or 30 minutes after your meal, you can have that snack that's healthy but not carbohydrates um, and not eating in between. So I highly recommend you watch that video, Biohacking Wellness on YouTube, just search it out, and it's called Biohacking Blood Sugar, and wean yourself down to a point where you can begin to keto adapt. Now, if you have diabetes, PCOS, or you have body fat to lose, you might want to spend some time in ketosis. It's the best feeling there ever could be. It's the best state of being ever. It's really kind of our native state. To be. We were born in ketosis. We got ketones from our mom's breast milk. It's a natural way to live. And there can be some occasional little bits of sugar in and out of the diet, but you know, typically really mostly burning ketones. Now, ketones, when you're burning them, are anti-inflammatory. As a matter of fact, once you start taking out all the sugar and grains, don't be surprised if all your body pain goes away because sugar and grains are inflammatory. And that means in the joints, in the, in the vessels, in the brain, in the liver, in the pancreas, you know, so metabolically, just not good. In the absence of glu uh, glucose, the brain can use ketones perfectly fine. And there are receptors all over the body, even in the muscles, that use ketones. Ketones generate more oxygen than glucose. They are a way better fuel for athletes, but the adaptation process will take time. Typically up to several weeks, your performance could suffer, but you can't give up. Give it the, give it the three to four weeks and you will begin to see major improvements in your performance, your cognitive function, 
ketones are neuroprotective and actually ketogenic diets have been used for epileptics for over a hundred years. There is perfect safety. So I encourage you to go out and Google ketones and insulin resistance, ketones and diabetes, ketones and epilepsy, ketones and all, whatever you want to put on the end of that. And you are going to get all the information you need. Then go out and Google glucose and, and compare the two. I think I would be resting my case at that point. So higher fat equals higher functioning as a human. And it doesn't matter if you're a long distance runner or if you're a grandma or a mom who's running her kids around to soccer and you just want to be a better version of yourself and not be so tired and not feel so run down and not be so frustrated that you can't lose any body fat. We're just overall, we need a metabolic makeover. So what can you experience by eating a higher fat diet? And we will be talking about the foods that um, would fall in that category. Well, first of all, fat loss, lots of focus, lots of energy. You're going to have minimal AGEs, advanced glycation end products, browning your tissues, unless you're cooking meat at too high a heat. Other than that, you're really limiting those AGEs. It lowers insulin, which can help to reverse insulin resistance, diabetes, and it can also go a long way towards helping you recover from PCOS and metabolic other metabolic disturbances, you will also probably find your heartburn diminishes because grains and sugars create a low stomach acid issue and we think it's high and we treat it the wrong way and sometimes it's just all related to what we're eating. And you take out those foods and everything goes away. It improves all biomarkers. What does that mean? That means that if you take your blood now, before you start this, that in six to eight weeks, although your cholesterol may increase a little bit for a while, I'm going to show you why that is not an issue, it usually goes back down, but you're going to have better cholesterol profiles. And when I talk about profiles, I'm not talking LDL and HDL and triglycerides. I'm talking about size and of and density of LDL. That is going to be the determining factor of how healthy your arteries are. That's coming up in a minute. But also, you're going to experience less inflammation, less joint aches and pains. Um, and also, there is a marker of inflammation called a high sensitivity C reactive protein test. And that should be less than one, <clears throat> ideally, less than 0.5. That's a direct marker of the body's inflammation. And also, of course, healthier blood sugar responses and increased antioxidant capacity. So all the things, whoops, that you can experience just from eating a little higher fat. So let's compare the food pyramid that we were given years ago in the 70s and what that looked like. And then compare that to what a keto or a higher fat pyramid would look like. And everybody's fat ratios um, are going to be different. A true ketogenic diet is typically 25 to under 50 grams. But even if someone cuts it down to between 50 and 70, huge difference. So much reduction in inflammation. So the old food pyramid said 6 to 11 servings of grains. So... I'm sure that every diabetic out there, if you have diabetes and you've been to a nutritionist, this was what they gave you. They told you, sure, you know, six to 11 servings of grain, some fruits and veggies, some little bit of milk and meat, but stay away from that fat and sugar. They did kind of caution on sweets sparingly, but what was the point in doing that when the 6 to 11 servings of grains were being recommended, it doesn't matter. It all turns into the same thing. Um, some of it turns into fructose, which is worse, but it all goes the same place. It all raises insulin. So this was really just a bunch of bunk 
And now the drug companies are laughing at us because most people today are on at least two medications by the time they reach the age of 50 if not more. So a ketogenic diet is a more ancestral diet. It's nothing out of a package. Like I said, it's shopping the perimeter of the store. So healthy meats, and I'm gonna show you which types of meats are the best to look for. Healthy meats, healthy fats. That's the basis and the bottom of your pyramid. So eggs, olive oil, grass-fed butter, coconut oil, those types of things. Green vegetables, nuts and seeds, some berries and some small fruits now and then. Um, some non-green vegetables occasionally as well, maybe a root vegetable here or there, but excluding everything at the bottom, sugar, pasta, milk, corn, beans, rice, except on rare occasions. Now, here is my general recommendation. If you are weaning down the three higher carbohydrate foods that I usually will include are some rice, white and wild is the best, um, you know, like a mixture of a white and wild rice or a brown rice and wild rice um, at no more than a half cup per serving several times a week. Let's say three would be the max. Um, or sweet potato uh, or beans. So those are the three things that if someone's going to have carbs, I always say those are the kind of carbs to have. Try not to have anything out of a box. Obviously, eating like this requires planning. And if you think it's more expensive, I'm gonna to prove to you that it's really not much more expensive to eat this way. Actually costs you more in, in your health in the long run. So this, the truth about cancer, thank you for this lovely infographic, because um, it's very simple. So what do I eat, right? Well, hopefully you've thrown everything out of your cupboard that comes in a box because it's not doing you any justice. We're doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results, which is we're not healthy. We're not where we want to be. We're not at our best weight. And we feel like crap, right? So I'm going to coach a ketogenic diet, but when I say a low-carb diet is wonderful as well, that means that you would include the three things that I just mentioned, beans sweet potato, some fruits, uh, beans, sweet potato, um, and maybe even quinoa could be something that you could do, and maybe some rice. Excuse me. <clears throat> so on top of the low-carb veggies, here's your list on the left, your protein sources. If you'll notice, the beef is grass-fed. It is not conventional hamburger like you buy at your local supermarket. That stuff is inflammatory because those cows are eating Grains. Grains are inflammatory. The meat gets inflammatory. You eat it and you are what you eat. So wild game, wild caught fish, um, shellfish, seafood, organic pastured poultry and eggs. Uh, you could even do um, an organic cheese if you wanted to do something like that. Uh, that would be fine as well, you know, or the organic dairy. And then healthy fats would be things like avocado, coconut oil, raw seeds, raw nuts, olive oil. Don't cook with it. You won't ruin its benefits. Uh, also butter, ghee. Those are also great. And other nut oils can be used as well, like um, walnut or almond or macadamia. And there are cookbooks out there. I'll be sharing some resources where you can make all kinds of wonderful meals. I'm going to show you a couple in a minute. So now is about the time where I think you're probably saying, but Sandra, are you out of your mind? What about the cholesterol? Well, when I said I was going to disrupt the status quo a little bit, I wasn't kidding, okay? Before, if you look at a Time magazine 15 years ago, it was all about how terrible cholesterol was. Don't eat the egg yolk. Everybody's eating the whites of the eggs. And now all you see on the cover of these magazines is healthy fats, healthy fats, healthy fats, healthy fats, eat butter, it's great. They were wrong, they were wrong, okay? So how do we feel comfortable about doing this, especially if we're over 40? This has been drilled down for decades to you and I totally get it, okay? How, how do we make sense of that? Take a look at these statistics for a minute, folks. I mean, really? All of these things that you're looking at right now were not caused by 
fat. They were caused by sugar. So an interesting fact about cholesterol, before I get into cholesterol a little bit, is this. The body tightly regulates the amount of cholesterol in the blood because every cell in the body needs it. Our brain is made of it. We are, you know, we are made of cholesterol. It's a beautiful substance that we really need. But the body controls internal production so that when cholesterol intake in the diet goes down, like on a low-fat diet, the body makes more. Okay, When cholesterol intake goes up, like on a high-fat diet, the body makes less. So initially when you start a higher fat diet, your cholesterol numbers will be all over the place and there's no point in looking at them and getting yourself upset, okay? It's just like the stock market and corrections in the housing market. It'll all correct itself out. You just have to stay the course. I've had clients call me freaking out, my cholesterol went up. And I said, don't have it tested for a few months, you know, give it some time. So, but let's, to feel comfortable about this, I understand that you really want to know, well, what is cholesterol really? Why am I being told that it's bad and I need to lower it and I need to stop eating fat and I need to stop doing this and stop doing that? Let's talk about what it is really. Quick bit of education is going to make you feel so much better. HDL and LDL are not cholesterol. Well, my doctor said my bad cholesterol is this. Sorry, LDL is not bad cholesterol. It's not cholesterol at all. And HDL is not cholesterol at all. They are both lipoproteins. High-density lipoprotein, low-density lipoprotein. Okay, so they're a little bit of a mixture there, but they have a protein component. And 25% of the cholesterol in your body comes from your food 75% your own body makes. Why would we do that if it was bad, right? Common sense. And I'm going to share a really quick little um, bit from Dr. Stephen Sinatra, who's a functional cardiologist. And one of the things that he says is, you know, cholesterol is something your body needs. If you look at the MR FIT study, multiple, multiple risk factor intervention trial that was done, they looked at 180 thousand men. That's not a small study. It's pretty big, right? Over a 13-year period, and men with cholesterol of 330 had less hemorrhagic stroke, that means a brain bleed, um, than men with cholesterols of less than 180, which would probably mean they were on a statin. So if you look at the numbers, right, we really need cholesterol. We need it to make our hormones for lubrication. You make all your sex hormones out of cholesterol. One of the things that people complain about when they get on a cholesterol medication is the fact that they lose their sex drive. Well, because first of all, their arteries are not functioning, pumping blood to important body parts, but also, um, you know, we can't even make sex hormones without cholesterol. So low cholesterol is bad, and you will probably die from that if you don't keep your cholesterol at healthy levels. How's that for a 360, right? Um, Alzheimer's and dementia, like I mentioned before. So honestly, this is what you need to worry about. If your shopping cart looks like this, there is a problem. Not only are we hurting ourselves, but we're hurting our kids. Gatorade. Oh, great sports drink, right? We need our electrolytes, but we don't need sugar. There's plenty of ways to get electrolytes without Gatorade. And I don't know of any food except for blueberries in the world that's that color blue. In a plastic bottle, no less. And those plastic bottles are contributing to body fat as well. So what we need to be doing is going on a BPA-free diet and cutting out all the packaging and all the bottles and all of those things that are causing even more hormonal disruption. So this card just goes to show you. Let me tell you, if you, I work in a supermarket, in a supplement section, but I see people shopping carts and they say that healthy food is expensive. This stuff is expensive. $4 almost for a bag of chips, 3 or $4 for Gatorade, 3 or $4 for Twinkies. You know, ramen noodles, well, they're cheap, right? Well, yeah, they're cheap, but they're, again, all sugar. So, honestly, 
is it really more important to, to be cheap about what we put in our bodies? I don't know about you guys. I'm worth way more than that. Okay. So these are the prob the, the problems with our food. Even things like yogurt. Some of these yogurts can have 25 grams of carbs. And for the most part, on when I'm really in ketosis, I don't eat more than 25 grams of carbs in a day. Okay. That's healthy. This stuff is going to put you way over the top. And not to mention dyes, colorings, artificial additives in plastic containers. This is not food. Food is information. This is garbage. Garbage, garbage. Got to get it out. Okay? So even if you're just eating whole foods, that is going to be the most wonderful thing you can do for yourself. Um, these foods cause inflammation, which causes injury to that artery. LDL carries that, um, carries those kind of sticky they call it fibrinogen, makes the blood sticky, and it goes and kind of wants to slap almost like a caulking into that artery because there's so much inflammation that the artery walls get damaged and cholesterol transports and patches that injury. That patch becomes a clot, that clot can break off, and that's where heart attacks and strokes can come from. For the most part, it doesn't build up and build up and build up um, in the arteries, well, it does, but it's not the stuff that's building up under the line, uh, under the lining so much that's been there for years and years. It's these new plaques from this new injury that are causing all the problems. So cholesterol, not a problem. What does a perfect plate look like? Oh, that's beautiful food right there. Is there anybody out there? Maybe you don't like salmon, but I mean, really, is there anybody out there that's objectionable over food like this? This is great food. Food is information, and there's a lot more than just proteins, carbs, and fats when it comes to information that food gives to your body, but we won't get into that at the moment. That's going to be coming up in one of our other trainings. So fast track to fat loss, we want to burn fat solely as fuel, right? In order to do that, we have to cut the carbs. So we wean down to the, you know, to the place where we feel comfortable enough to make the shift to maybe 25 to no more than 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. That's where we're going to get the most benefit, the most benefit, and the sweet spot being 25 to 30 grams a day. Now, as we're doing this, you're going to notice, like I said, energy is going to go up, fat loss focus is going to go up. How long can you go on a high-fat ketogenic eating strategy? Well, as long as you want. But I do talk a lot about cycling um, in and out because it can be healthy to do that just like we did you know, when we were walking with our knuckles dragging on the ground. But the other strategy, and one of the other reasons that we want to get to a point where we can cut those carbs low enough is because we need to control the hunger enough to do something that is, oh, the miracle of, is just honestly the best health hack in the world, running on ketones and fasting. Now, when I say fasting, I don't mean juice fasts because when somebody goes on a juice fast, although they may, you may have done that in the past, how many of you have done that? Um, the thing with juice is, again, you know, we typically as humans didn't have access to 10 or 12 different fruits blended in a glass. That's going to raise insulin. That's going to raise fructose in the liver, fatty liver disease. So even fruit must be kept to a minimal to be healthy. You can start lower and then work up to a point where you add maybe one or two fruits a day. For me, Two fruits a day is two fruits too many. I can do um, servings of fruit several times a week, but typically I don't do it every day. I have the kind of blood sugar that just doesn't allow for that. Very carb sensitive. Now it's best to fast for 12 or more hours. Most people fast for approximately eight, whatever amounts of sleep you get, and then typically you get up, most people have a breakfast. The most benefits come from fasts of 12 hours or greater. And you actually burn more fat at night. So it's really important that you're not having carbs um, at the wrong time, like right before bed, um, unless 
there are certain circumstances, let me put it this way, in which you would want to do that. But I'm not going to get into that. Um, it mainly um, applies to women and women with adrenal fatigue, but I'm not going to get into that. And you typically wouldn't be fasting if you had adrenal fatigue. Anyhow, we'd want to wait till you were healthy. But um, it can be good for adrenal health, but we can talk about that at another time. Pretty much, we talk about intermittent fasting. So an intermittent fast is just eating in a more condensed eating window. It's one or two meals a day. Some people will skip the lunch meal and put eight to 12 hours in between breakfast and dinner. Some people will skip the dinner meal, other people will skip the breakfast meal and not eat till 11 o'clock or noon. And I know that we've been told that six meals a day, it's, it's been drilled into our heads, I get it. I was doing some of the drilling for a while myself, and I'm here to tell you that I was wrong, it's wrong, it's not the right strategy, we got it all backwards, okay? So if we wanna control our hunger and our body fat and our insulin, then we want to be able to get to a point where we can eat in a narrow eating window. So if you're eating one to two meals most days, that is where your body is going to be the healthiest, but it will take some time to get there. Now, other benefits aside from fat loss, of course, there are going to be significant reductions in body fat without loss of lean mass, the closer you get to a ketogenic diet. As long as you're not eating too much protein, because protein is insulinogenic. So too much protein causes our body to make sugar out of those amino acids from the protein. And even though you may have been on that, you know, the Atkins type diet where they ate a lot of meat at the time, they didn't talk about the fats as much. Um, that was why a lot of people didn't do well with that. So um, it's mostly a high fat diet. But when we fast or we have ketones in our body to mimic fasting, and there are now ways to do that, which I will cover it another time, but longevity, people who eat less live longer. Plain and simple fact. Also, it has a positive effect on gene expression. It turns on genes that make us healthy and switches off genes like cancerous genes that make us sick and unwell. Also, you will have a heightened mood, great mental clarity, you just overall are gonna feel a whole lot better. So that's our training for tonight. I hope you learned a lot. If you've got any questions, reach out to me at Sandra at Biohacking Wellness, um, and I will answer those questions for you. Uh, I would also suggest that you read. You can read more about fats and fasting on my www.biohackingwellness.com website. I also do private coaching of small groups from one to four people, or I can do Skype or FaceTime. The rate would be $33 an hour. It's a special rate for you guys. So if you want that, just email me and I can hook you up with that and we can coach and do a little bit of presentation that's more individualized to somebody's special needs. Um, email me if you have any other questions or anything else you would like to see or didn't understand. So next week, we're going to be doing a whole different training that's going to be a little bit on the best exercise for fat loss and how to get away with the least amount of exercise and get the most health benefits. But I'm really glad you joined me tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time. Again, this is Sandra Miller. Have a wonderful evening. Our next training is, hold on, I'm going to look on the calendar, Wednesday. July 20th at 7.30 p.m. And if you miss it, don't worry, I got you back. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for being with me tonight. And I'll see you all next time.